We now move to oral questions, first of all, to the Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Sean Rogers. Number one, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Uh, sport and I is the body responsible for the development of sport across the north. And all clubs can contact Sport and I to discuss their development, their plans for development for a recreational pitch. Sport and I are, are, are able to provide advice and guidance and are best to prepare for funding programmes, including Sport and I opportunities, and to help identify other potential funding sources. Ballinagross or Ballinagross FC are also able to contact their local council for advice and support, given the responsibility for provision of adequate facilities for recreation, social and physical and cultural activities rest with the district councils. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for response. Uh, Minister, I've always found the, your, your officials very helpful when we're dealing with other clubs. Um, will the officials help the club to identify f further funding streams in order to, to move forward? Um, I thank the member for his comments. Um, certainly, I mean, both our officials in conjunction with Sport and I and both um, are there uh, to help clubs develop their facilities and even, as I said in the, the primary answer, to try and point and guide other potential sources of funding. So if, I, if I'm reading the member right, I, I'm happy to pass that request on to officials to liaise with yourself to set that meeting up. Members, this is a specific question to a specific constituency. Uh, can the Minister give us an update on the capital programme uh, from Sports NI, uh, when it will be rolled out and who can apply? Order. I did warn members that that is well off the original question on the order paper and, and we really should uh, uh, move on if there is no further supplementaries to the particular question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd uh, like to ask the Minister, given the release of uh, information regarding letter of comfort of offer of £10 million to a Belfast club, will she ensure that the IFA oh, strategies oh, for order, facilities... Order. Oh, order. Uh, Sorry, sir. I'm listening to the member, but I detect uh, the member is far away from the original question. It's a particular, it's a, this is a particular question yep. to a particular subject. Yep. And is the member going to use his initiative to link it? Yes. Right. Let's listen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And just to finish that off, uh, will the minister confirm that the AFA strategies facilities will not have a predetermined outcome that would be against Ballinagross Football Club? <laughs> oh, order, no, order. <laughs> the, up until that point, the member did extremely well. <laughs> did, did extremely well. Can we move on, David McNary? Uh, question two. I thank the member for his question. Prony's target market is any user seeking to access his archives. In 2012-2013, Prony welcomed sev almost 17,000 visitors on site and recorded over 10 million page views on the Prony website. They also provide free events, a free events programme, and actively try to reach to new audience, audiences, <coughs> particularly those who live in areas uh, of social exclusion and poverty. In October this year, Community Change NI brought a group to Prony which included members of the Prince Women's Centre in Poglas and the Regimental Association of the UDR and also welcomed cross-community group of adults from the Dungannon area led by Youth Action NI who visited Prony to find out more about the decade of centenaries. Prony has also worked closely with the Historical Institute institutional abuse inquiry during the past 18 months. This research supports the ongoing work of the inquiry as victims come forward and inquiry researchers are based in Prony building to facilitate direct records. David McNary, Mr. McNary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, the, the point I'd like her to grasp is that family, uh, family history is the overwhelming reason why people go there. That's what the figures say, 75, 77% interested in family history, but yet the Prony website rates it only as fifth out of six reasons why they keep archives. That poses the question, uh, Speaker, to the, to the Minister, are we charging some users enough, such as legal users or government bodies, who are needing to consult these archives? 
Well, the member has presented uh, statistics that are in, uh, contradict the information that I have. So, in fairness to his question, what I'll do is I'll try and find out the right answer. But the question also remains to be answered is, are enough people using PRONI for all sorts of reasons? I'm happy for people, regardless of what their reason is, to come forward and use PRONI. I'd like to see more people uh, using it for, um, to look at their family trees, look at their, their lineage and the rest. But I don't want to be prescriptive. I think PRONI is a public service. It's a nice and public service. And the more people using it, the better for public benefit. It's a good thing. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The figures show that the local history usage is about 5%. Uh, does the Minister not agree that given the rich history that various groups and communities have in Northern Ireland, that she should attempt to drive that figure up so that people can utilise PRONI as they should be and get the maximum use out of it into their own local communities? In short, I totally agree with the member. I'd like to see that figure increase. I think it's incredibly low. I'm actually surprised. Uh, I, as I said to Mr McNary, I'm, I'm certainly going to query that. And if it means having to look to see if any, what additional resources or even just a redeployment of priorities around PRONI to try and make sure that, that figure increases. I'm really keen to do that, particularly when I spoke recently to a group of older people who, you know, for the first time ever are starting to look back into their lineage, into their family trees, and I don't want them to be prevented or put off from doing so, particularly when they're travelling from his own constituency in uh, Derry to Belfast. Blaine McCurley. I thank the Minister for answers to this point. Um, can the Minister tell us, does PRONI do enough to attract other users who aren't family historians? Um, well, PRONI would say that they do, and I have no evidence thus far to say that they haven't. Uh, is there something we could do more and better off? I think that seems to be the consistent theme from certainly this question and the previous questions. It has reconstituted its user form to include stakeholders from a wide range of groups, including representatives from libraries, from museums, uh, the Workers' Education Association, Educational Training Expectorate, Tourism Ireland, um, and certainly even some bloggers and people who are involved in social media. But certainly I'll, have a, I'll be taking the figures that are presented to me today back, uh, bringing it to Pony's attention to see what else we can do because it is an excellent public service. It's a beautiful building. It's something the public should have access to, and we need to find out what particular interests they have in order to make that access greater. Dominic Bradley, Mr. Bradley. Good morning, Mr. Bradley. Good morning, Mr. Bradley. Pibli or Bogo and Ifig G and Catherine Titanic. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if there has been an increase in the number of people using the facilities and services of the Public Records Office since it moved to the Titanic water? And if so, can she provide figures? Well, I, I have. I thank first of all thank the member for his question. I have anecdotal evidence to say that their, uh, the site in Titanic Quarter is much more accessible than it was in Balmoral Avenue. But I, I haven't got the figures, so I uh, commit to writing to a member with those figures. But certainly, I mean, access was an issue around uh, getting access to public records in the past. You know, given that almost £30 million pounds of public money was spent on the new building, the last thing that we need to hear is it's still hard to reach or out of reach for people. That's not good use of public money. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Question number three, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for his question. The main proposed change to fishing in Loch Ney for the 24 season is a prohibition of the taking of salmon by, needs, by means of a draft net. This is one of the sweetest salmon conservation, conservation measures that I'm proposing, and my department is currently consulting on the draft legislation to put to be put before the House. The proposed amendment will allow those who fulfil the criteria for a draft net for freshwater fish in Loch Ney to be issued with such a licence, but they will not be permitted to take any salmon and any caught must be returned to the water. There are a number of other issues relating to fishing in Loch Ney which have been raised by stakeholders, and these are currently 
being considered by DECAL. Any decision will be based on scientific advice and sustainability of the fishery. If changes are to be implemented, the relevant legislation will require an amendment. <laughs> and to that end, I have also asked officials to undertake work to develop a detailed fishery management plan for Loch Ness, which will inform sustainable management of the fishery. And I thank the other uh, minister for that information, which you shared particularly on the, uh, the draft uh, nets. Could the minister tell us whether she is considering a specific proposition to amend the rules on uh, bait nets use on Loch Ness as well? Um, Loch, Ness com Loch Ness commercial fishermen have put forward a proposal to my department to amend the legislation in relation to the use of bait nets. Bait nets are used by fishermen to catch small fish that are then used to bait eel long lines. The alternative is to use worms as bait, but this can result in smaller eels being caught, and this has a negative impact on the overall eel stocks. The fishermen would like to see trawl bait net, as this has a more effective way of catching the amount of small fish they require. But as I said in the primary <coughs> answer, AFBI, um, and that's a scientific uh, evidence that I spoke about, um, are doing research into the use of bait nets and will advise me uh, on the information before I make any decision on this matter. Michelle Mayelby. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what efforts she and her department are making to assist members of the Loch Ness Fishermen's Association in obtaining eel fishing permits? And is she aware that members have been threatened for having raised this issue? Um, well, first of all, I'll take our last point first. I'm totally unaware that members have been threatened for raising an issue. I actually don't understand the context, but I, I appreciate that the member has raised a serious issue, which I'm more than happy to speak with her about and indeed speak to the people concerned about. Um, in relation to the other, I don't have the details at hand, but I'm happy to write to the member. But I'm certainly alarmed at the idea of anybody being threatened, let alone threatened for raising an issue. It's totally unacceptable. Robin Swan. Mr. Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Has the Minister had any engagement with the European Commission yet about the increase of eel fishing either in Loch Ness or Loch Erne? I speak after following meeting Bernard Fries, who is the European Commissioner for the North Atlantic recently, along with Jim Nicholson. Um, Jim Nicholson, your MEP candidate for the European election. Yes, OK, I know who that is. Um, yes, I have had discussions. My officials have had discussions with um, Europe, particularly around the proposed Lovett Amendment. Um, and the officials and the discussions with European um, fisheries experts are still ongoing. I think, you know, to be, to be fair to the member, I think there is genuine concern around preservation of eels, uh, particularly around Loch Ness, where there is a need management plan. Um, but certainly, uh, <coughs> those discussions will be ongoing because what we need to make sure, first of all, our stocks and our rivers and our waterways increase, that they're protected, that they're sustained, and indeed the 300 plus families on the loch continue to have a secure livelihood. Um, of well over £3 million pounds a year. Uh, so I thank the member for his questions. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. De uh, Mr. Speaker. Question four, please. Um, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll take questions four and six together. Uh, the NI Commonwealth Games Council are responsible for all aspects of the North of Ireland team competing in the 2014 Glasgow Games. My department through Sport and I continues to work closely with the Council as it takes forward its preparations for the Games. The Council has established two groups, an operational group to take forward the detailed preparations with the local governing bodies and the strategic task and finish group which oversees the work of the operational group and considers opportunities to maximise our team's performance in Glasgow. DECAL officials have attended these meetings of this group to hear at first hand how the, game prep the Games preparations are progressing. And from April 2013 and the lead up to the Games, my department through Sport and I is also providing direct financial assistance to the Commonwealth Games C Council, tot totalling £136,000. This funding will help the Council's costs for staff, administration and other associated costs with the attendance at the 2014 Games. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her update and welcome the news. Um, I'm sure the Minister and members will join with me in welcoming the news that Northern Ireland uh, netball, netball team are to take part in the Commonwealth Games next year, given the fact that it has been uh, since we haven't had a team 
uh, take part since 1998 in Kuala Lumpur. So can I ask the Minister what she's doing to develop greater participation um, for team sports? Um, I thank the member for a question and I share in her congratulations with the netball team. Um, you know, given the fact that they've had recent successes and I'm delighted to see them compete now in different forms and wish them all the best. In terms of team sports, and particularly sports for women and particularly sports around disabilities. Uh, it's important that uh, we continue to provide current funding but additional funding, particularly around Commonwealth Games, to help those performing, and we have done that. Um, I mean, Sport NI provides £2.5 million to the Sports Institute here to help support athletes who are competing. Um, there are other additional costs that have been brought forward, you know, packages around 450,000 to government bodies as well to help them prepare. And I think that level of funding needs to be continued because if the athletes who are competing, regardless of where they're competing or how they're competing, aren't supported, first of all, by the governing body and then aren't supported at the high levels through the Institute, they're going to feel that it's, uh, they're not valued and it's going to have an impact on their performance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it fits neatly on from my, my colleague's question. She'll be aware that in Northern Ireland we have a proud history of producing some of the best hockey players competing both for Ireland and indeed uh, for Great Britain. She will also be aware that there's no Northern Ireland hockey team. Would she therefore, though it's too late for the, the Games next year, would she uh, seek a meeting with the Irish Hockey Union and see if she could um, help form a Northern Ireland hockey team for the next Commonwealth Games to ensure that our elite athletes playing hockey in Northern Ireland aren't uh, prevented from competing in the Commonwealth Games? I thank the member for his question, and I think it was to, uh, to, at a previous question time to his party colleague, Jim Wales, who asked me to do the same thing over rugby sevens. I don't get involved. I'm not interfering. I don't think people should interfere politically. It's up to the governing bodies what arrangements they decide to have. Um, whether we like the outcome or not, we need to support them. And that's the bottom line. We should not interfere politically in the decisions that governing bodies have made. We need to support them, regardless if we don't like them or not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? And can I ask her uh, what discussions she's had with the Northern Ireland Commonwealth Games Council on the prospect of bidding to host the Commonwealth Games in the future? I thank the member for his question. I haven't had any discussions with the Commonwealth Games Council at all in relation to hosting a future Commonwealth Games. At one of maybe two question times or three question times ago, incidentally, by asked by Alistair Ross. Would I support Valadrome and support uh, hosting a bid? Um, and I'm keen to have a look at that, but I haven't had any discussions. Certainly, I've had discussions with officials, and they're aware that we need to do a very, very serious scoping exercise, but that's as far as it's went, to be honest. Leslie Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder, would the Minister be prepared to confirm that she's prepared to promote the magnificent Aurora Swimming Centre in Bangor as a training location prior to the Commonwealth Games next year? I'd like to think so. We put uh, millions and millions of pounds of public money into it, uh, and I'd like to think that Bangor, it's, a, it's a, certainly a facility that athletes in the north can use, not just people in that constituency. So absolutely, for that competition and many others, and indeed, you know, it's very, very important that young people who are interested in swimming now feel that once they're in that pool, or any other pool for that matter, but particularly that pool given the facilities that they have, can go from swimming on a Saturday morning to performing, and that's really, really important that we support that journey. I thank the member for his question. Um, while I have no plans to announce any cultural bursaries yet, it is, however, my intention to launch another Gale Talk bursary scheme in December this, this year. The Gale Talk Bursary Scheme is aimed at broadening the appeal of the Irish language and offers the opportunity, irrespective of traditions or backgrounds, for el eligible applicants to have a chance of attending an Irish language summer course. The scheme also helps leave the participants and financial outlays which may occur as a barrier to them in accessing uh, a Gale Talk course. Uh, I thank the Minister. Uh, could the Minister give us her assessment of how she thinks that DECAL could encourage interest in Irish language amongst the unions community? I mean, the very essence of Leaf, the LEFA initiative is about making the language accessible to all, and I firmly believe that the Irish language does that. LEFA continues to implement outreach work to groups and individuals from all walk, walks of life. For example, this week, LEFA will take part in a cross community event in Fermanagh, 
organised by the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland and the GAA to bring young people from Protestant Catholic backgrounds to explore our cultural richness through sharing and learning uh, through music and through language and culture. And such events provide a good opportunity to promote LIFA. Um, and it, it's events like the LIFA birth, birthday celebration, which allow everybody across the community to celebrate in a cultural ritual heritage. William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following on from the previous questioner's uh, supplementary question, would the Minister agree that one of the things that would attract the unionist community perhaps to take part in Irish language classes was if the Irish language wasn't being used as a political tool by politicians? And you've just done that. <laughs> and, 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 you've, and you've just done that. And it's, it's during um, experiences and examples like that where it's really unhelpful. And it's not very supportive from people from your constituency who are learning the Irish language. It's not giving good leadership. And I think I totally agree with you. What we need to do is not politicise any language. Andrew Overe. <coughs> Mrs Overe. Question number six, please. DECAL has a programme for government target of supporting 200 projects through the Creative Industries Innovation Fund. 148 awards have been made thus far and others are expected to be finalised shortly. A further funding round opens up in January 2014 for projects being delivered by March 2015. I am confident that our programme for, tar program for government target will be achieved, if not exceeded. The Arts Council recently held a conference to showcase companies which have received support from the fund. The event supported wider industry networking and demonstrated the importance of co contributing to the fund and heart makes growing our creative industries a priority. Uh, social clauses have also been introduced into the fund to provide industry support to schools engagement programmes, particularly those schools with young people from deprived backgrounds. This initiative will help inspire the next generation of creative entrepreneurs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I wonder, could the Minister outline in, in further detail work uh, carried out by her department alone or in conjunction with other departments dedicated to ensuring that young people in Northern Ireland are adequately skilled in order to snap up any opportunities that are available in the creative industry sector? Um, I thank the, the member for her question. I mean, certainly we had a, <coughs> excuse me, a pilot scheme in a, a deprived area of Belfast and West Belfast, where we invest in iPads going to schools. Uh, coincidentally, it's an area in which suffers the worst child poverty, probably in Western Europe. And the evidence coming back, not that we knew um, it would certainly be contested, <laughs> but the evidence coming back is that children and young people who had difficulties completing homework, as soon as they got an iPad, not only completed their homework, but completed it in record time and certainly expanded on it. And literally, their self-confidence and self-esteem has been raised through using a graphic design with the iPad. And it certainly gives them an avenue and an opening that they didn't have before. And we're keen to replicate that work, particularly within the top 10 percent of most deprived wards. But certainly, I'm meeting with the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development to see what we can do in rural areas, because it is a wonderful opportunity. There have been other uh, programmes that have been supported as part of Digital Circle, Circle Culture Tech and others that have been supported, because it is critical that we use every influence within each of our departments to try and make sure that we not only meet our programme for government commitments, not only exceed them where possible, but we look for opportunities that have arisen outside of what we agreed some two years ago. So I'm happy that certainly the iPads initiative that DECAL have introduced will be rolled across the board, given I get the support of executive colleagues. John Dallet, Mr. Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. This is very exciting stuff, and obviously, I am sure the Assembly would want to have it spread across the whole 26 councils. Can I ask the, the Minister if, in fact, all 26 councils are participating? In other words, are they all culture vultures in this respect? And if not, uh, what will the Minister do to ensure that there is no disparity uh, across Northern Ireland in this respect? I thank the member for his question, and he can certainly talk <laughs> about his own uh, council area, and I just couldn't possibly comment if their culture vultures or not. I know there's been criticisms before that certainly the uh, applications mainly came from Belfast and Derry City council areas, and that was a big concern, and I would certainly encourage 
other councils to try and make sure that they have applications, some of the Creative Industries Innovative Fund. And certainly they should work and talk to organisations as the Arts Council and NI Screen to try and make sure that they're, they're making use of every available opportunity. Because I have absolutely no doubt the example that I give, this is over in terms of the children and young people, in terms of small business incubation <clears throat> and development, I would like to see all 26 council areas, depending on what their needs are, availing of that fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what, um, what she is doing to uh, ensure that the funding gap uh, provided for the arts in Northern Ireland is um, adhered to um, regarding the, the, the uh, funding for other, uh, in other regions, other jurisdictions? There is a gap in the arts, and what is the Minister doing to try and bridge that gap? Um, I, I'm assuming the member's talking about the Creative Industries Innovation Fund, or just rather than just arts across the board. Well, uh, I would prefer to keep it the Creative Industries Innovation Fund because it's a general question, it's not linked, and I don't want to not give you an answer, to be frank. Um, but, the member shouldn't interrupt the Minister. But what I would say is that in the member's area of Strangford, if he feels that the council areas in that constituency haven't availed properly of the Creative Industries Fund, then certainly he could talk to the Arts Council and at the NI screen. Um, so if the member has any other questions in relation to any other aspects of arts funding, I'm more than happy to answer them, either by a priority written question, written question, he can knock my door, he can write a letter, he can stop me in the corridor, there's absolutely no bother. He doesn't have to wait the next question time to ask me a very important question like that. Uh, order, order. We thank, thank the minister for, for her answer so far, and I commend the, the, the program going forward of the department working with local councils. Can I ask the minister for an update in terms of the CIIF, uh, in terms of how that has worked beneficially for the assembly and local councils in taking it forward in a collaborative approach that's being uh, undertaken? Well, first of all, I thank the member for his question because I think it is a successful program, and the fact that we have not only met our target but are exceeding our target shows there's, there's a demand. I think the concern is that the demand seems to be based on uh, creative or digital or cultural hubs, particularly in Belfast and Derry City Council areas. That's not what's starting to say that other areas can't avail of it, they can, and I'm willing to help them do that. But certainly a collaborative approach is important, <coughs> particularly when you're looking at other investments, which the Belfast City Council has done, to try and marry those pots of money up to get a better return, and I think that's what it's all about. So it's not only looking at the investment that you can provide through local investments or even city investment funds, but how you can do it with entrepreneurs, and even how you can show people who are considering the private sector route how they can avail of opportunities that they perhaps didn't know they have. And I think councils are best place, or one of the best place agencies and bodies to do that. Kirsten over a shot. Question number seven. Uh, I thank the member for his question, and he may recall that the, this particular library has been previously marked for closure, and he will be aware that the local community were determined to save their service and worked in partnership with libraries and I to obtain financial support from the Rural Development Programme and the Big Lottery Fund. This community initiative resulted in the establishment of a modern replacement library and a multi-purpose community centre. The library, which was officially opened by my executive colleague Michelle O'Neill on the 11th of September, is now attracting new users and providing an expanded programme of activities and initiatives. This partnership venture is a success, and with active membership of the library, library as from October has increased by 23% compared to where it was last year, and that's exactly what we need to see. We need to see libraries been used as a <coughs> dynamic community hub uh, and as a focal point for local communities. Amen. Gurmagutta, Ken Kulyar, Augusta Mawekas Don Era, Don Fragration. Could I ask the Minister, or thank the Speaker for that and the Minister for her comments, um, what has been done to improve the library service uh, for users in rural areas generally? Well, I thank the member again for his question. And as I said in my primary answer, I'm working with my executive colleagues in this, particularly around the Rural White Paper Action Plan, which sets out a vision for sustainable rural communities and indeed services within those communities. And libraries have 28 branches located in rural areas, which play a valuable role in that regard. I am really keen to make sure that libraries are sustained, they're maintained, and they're not just used they're in isolation, that they're seen as part of a wraparound public service, particularly in rural areas which face ongoing exclusion and isolation. 
Members, that concludes all questions to the Minister. We now move to topical questions to the Minister. Uh, Michael McGimsey is not in his place. <coughs> Stephen Mutry is not in his place. And I call Michelle McElveen. Ms McElveen. Who is in her place? Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the, the Minister will be aware that the committee recently visited the University of Ulster, Jordanstown. And could I ask her whether she has any, had any discussions with the university, and in particular the Ulster Sports Academy, about their exciting vision for a sports hub at the campus? Um, I thank the member for her question. I have plans to meet the Sports Institute early in the new year. Uh, I know officials have had meetings with Sport NI in relation to ongoing support. The member and other members of Cal Company will be aware that I made a substantial investment uh, into the Sports Institute, but I think we need to look at future proofing a long-term usage of sports facilities. I thank the Minister for her answer, but would she be supportive of exploring the creation of centres of sporting excellence at Jordanstown, um, for example, a neutral, neutral venue for a boxing academy and indeed an indoor velodrome? Um, well, certainly um, I'm happy to meet with the Sports Institute to look to see what future. I don't want to commit myself to anything in particular. I, I am, the velodrome is one of the issues that is on the agenda for discussion, uh, particularly because since the last appraisal was done, the, I suppose the, the demand and certainly the, the, the users involved in um, bicycles and racing and competitive racing has increased tenfold. So certainly I'm happy to talk to the Institute about the velodrome. I hadn't any plans to talk to the Institute about boxing, but I've no, no reason why I wouldn't. Hello. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Given the growth in interest of cycling and the importance of the um, Tour of North International Cycle Race uh, to, to the cycling fraternity, will the Minister's Department be willing or able to support the 40,000 funding required to run this in yeah. April 2014? Um, well, I'm currently meeting uh, members, not only, I'm meeting members who are representing all the governing bodies to look at gaps in certain funds, particularly around events. I don't want to commit myself to saying, yes, uh, I will be funding the gap, um, but certainly happy to look at it because what we need to do is we all need to play our part in making sure that events, should it be primarily sporting events, cultural events, tourist events, that we make sure that there are no gaps, and first of all, make sure that there are no gaps that prevent the, the event happening in the first place. So I'm happy to um, take details of the member to bring it forward. But there are certainly, in relation to cycling and competitive cycling and racing, there are a number of proposals that have been brought to my attention recently. I'm not too sure if they're the same ones or different ones, and I need to look at them all in the round. But I'm certainly happy to look at plug-in holes and gaps, particularly when Given the year of the Giro coming here, we need to try and be very, very proactive in making sure that all opportunities, uh, all, all communities uh, who don't, won't experience the Giro get an opportunity to experience something similar. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted uh, by the answer from the Minister, and I hope she will meet uh, with the group fairly soon because you know, time's running on. And, and would the Minister uh, agree that this would be almost a, a, a first step? and particularly will help all the organisers and the PSNI in preparing for the, um, can't say it properly, Gero uh, d'Italia uh, in coming years? Um, well, just to share with the member, the PSNI, um, in conjunction with the Tourist Board and um, the governing bodies, have been meeting regularly around plans for this. It's not like, you know, we know it's common, but we haven't done anything about it. That is not the case. The, the groups that have asked to meet me about funding gaps. I'm not too sure if it's funding gaps within their group or funding gaps around this event or other events or just funding gaps in terms of the sport itself. But what I will give the member a commitment, I have asked to meet the governing bodies and I've already agreed to meet a couple of cycling clubs to see what we can do. I'm taking a can-do attitude. If I've got the money and I've got the support of executive colleagues, particularly in terms of events that we all are keen to support, we'll certainly be proactive and we'll do what we can. We're all taking a can do attitude. Mr. Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister give a rough estimate of how many people viewed the recent successful Brighter, Gord, uh, Brighter Hoard exhibition in Limavady? 
the beautiful Broider Horde in the members' constituency. Um, I've no idea, and there are still people I've heard from Belfast who come up tomorrow evening. Must be some event on tomorrow evening, but they're going up anyway, which is good because Belfast people don't travel very well. Um, and I do think it's very, very good, particularly when I heard about children and young people from schools going to see the Broider Horde. I think the original expectations will be really succeed, exceeded, and I'm hoping to hear the final figures. I think for people who haven't been to Limavada yet to see the Broider Horde, they should go. It's a rare treat, uh, and I'm glad to see the Broider come back to where it belongs. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Minister for her answer. And the supplementary would be, would the Minister give consideration to supporting a permanent display of the Broider Horde in Limavady, the borough in which it was found, even if some of the pieces would have to be replicas? I certainly would, and I'd be certainly keen to have discussions with the museums uh, and certainly with the people who are procuring it at the minute. But certainly I, I believe passionately that it should come back to where it was found and where it belongs. And not even that, I believe, in that area where there has not been many opportunities, particularly around tourism, presented to it over decades, that the broader gold hoard is one opportunity that we can't afford not to fight for. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, is the Minister satisfied that all the various traditions in London die have been properly promoted and, re and represented during the city's year as UK City of Culture? Um, I would be, but there are always com complaints perhaps, and concerns at times where I always felt that maybe they were passed by. But certainly, I have met many groups, and not just the big ticket events, but many groups within the community, who are not only happy that they got involved this year, but certainly looking at how they can strengthen their work as part of the legacy from this year and beyond, and that is from across the community. Mr. Anderson. I thank the Minister for that answer, but can I ask the Minister what her department has done or is doing? Uh, for the annual Apprentice by Shutting of the Gates pageant in the City of London Dairy on Saturday, the 7th of December, as a major uh, event, cultural event. Um, I am not aware of the department giving any specific support for that, um, but certainly, I mean, I was at events where the Apprentice Boys for Dairy were there. They have been for, part of the uh, cultural programme. Uh, but what I can do is check with officials to see um, whether any requests. Um, but certainly supportive. And I mean, as a woman living in North Belfast, I think there's many things that we can look towards the apprentice for by examples of what we need to do. Because up and down the road over this past year and even more, it almost becomes a tale of two cities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know from oral questions that Mr. McGuinness had a question down to do with C.S. Lewis and the public commemorations. Um, I want to ask about the legacy. Um, can I ask the Minister how we can ensure that the legacy of this great writer um, can be used to encourage greater involvement in literature and the arts? Um, the, I thank the member for a question. And, um, the member may be aware that there was an adjournment debate brought forward by our par party colleague Sammy Douglas last week. It was unfortunate that an application in, I think it was to the Arts Council, missed the deadline for the C.S. Lewis Festival. However, we're working with the East Belfast Partnership and to try and make sure that there is a legacy around C.S. Lewis. And the bits of funding that have been used for the festival thus far haven't been huge, but they've been very, very effective. And I'm keen to make sure that C.S. Lewis isn't confined to the, the, the dust books of history, that we need to, he's a proud Belfast man, and we need to be proud of him and use whatever opportunities we can to celebrate his work uh, and to ensure that the legacy of his work is passed on from one generation to another and that we all know who he is. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her answer. And just to follow on from that again, um, she had mentioned there about this passing on from one generation to the next. Can I ask her if she's had any, um, her, her department has had any talks with the Department of Education on the legacy of C.S. Lewis and how we can promote this in our schools to bring young people forward with literature and the arts? I haven't had any discussions with the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. Uh, and given the, the, the literature um, that he's produced, and in, you know, given the fact that a lot of children now would be aware of the Narnia stories, that it would be a missed opportunity not to try and advance any opportunities we have across the executive. But certainly happy to talk to the Department of Education to see what we're doing around C.S. Lewis as it is. And it's maybe something that we can do better next year, because I do think there will be opportunities, rather than waiting to a big significant date, there are opportunities that we need to do in between Try and raise a, raise a profile of some of our cultural giants. Ron McGann. 
Speaker, in Miyagata, would the Minister agree with me that Owen Rua Hurland Club in Dungannon needs redeveloped uh, given the increase in club membership? Uh, yes, I would, and the member, because she, she invited me down, um, would be aware that I, I had a visit. Uh, there were many, many children uh, crammed into a very, very small space, delighted they're, they're involved in sport, delighted that there's boys and girls uh, involved in sport together. Uh, but, you know, we would agree with the member that there is a need to look at uh, the development of facilities, and I'm happy, as I've indicated to other members, to have those meetings with her uh, and officials with sport, and I to take it forward. Ron McGann. Gurum Yogurt, my, my supplementary has been answered regarding a further invite with uh, the, the club, so I'd appreciate it if we could follow up on that. Thank you. I mean, I, I confirm that. I'm genuine about that, not only to the, the member of my own party, but to other members. I'm happy to facilitate a, a, a time that suits her sport and I in the club. Uh, number nine, Dr. Alison MacDonald's not in his place. Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, has she any assessment about the shortage of provision, particularly for football uh, in Northern Ireland? But sorry, facil- facilities, that is. Sorry, I, I didn't hear your last part. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, in particular, the facilities, the provision of facilities for football in Northern Ireland. Um, I thank the member for his question. I'm aware that some council areas have actually done uh, a, a needs analysis of the different levels of sport within each of the council areas. And some have, uh, like for example, in Coleraine, in Belfast, Derry, other places have produced a, a deficit, not just for football, um, hockey, and uh, I think some other track and field. But certainly across the board, there's a lack of facilities. And some of the council groups are actually talking to officials within Sport NI to say about the and others, big lottery, to say about the potential of trying to bring forward, uh, I suppose, a collaborative approach to provision. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the minister for a response to the question? Uh, and, give, and given her response to the previous question, in particular, on an, an, an individual club, can the minister outline? I mean, in my own area in South Antrim and Antrim in particular, there is under provision for football, as you have identified, and for hockey. Can the minister indicate what her department could do to address that, given that these people who participate in the sport can go on to gr- greater, bigger, and greater things? Um, well, I'm happy to meet with a member and representatives of Antrim and some of the governing bodies in the new year, if that's, that would help the member. Um, I mean, the last thing I want to see is some areas will provision by postcode. And I, I don't want to see that. There will never be enough money to try and meet the need, but there are certainly inventive ways that we can work towards trying to achieve the same ends if we look at different potential sources of funding. And I appreciate for some groups on the ground, at some times, who's going to blink first? Did they get it from Decon Sport and I? Did they get it from the Council? They don't really care as long as they get it. So I'm happy to do a meeting in the New Year see what we can take forward. Order, that concludes question time. We will now return to the